Why do you say that, Father? You aren't afraid, are you? No. But I respect some of the superstitions of others. Often they are founded in fact. Broadcasting live from our Sanctum Sanctorum in Venice, California. This is the Sixth Sense Society. I'm your host, Krista, here with our producer, Michael. And today you are tuning in to Spell It Out, Magic, Reflections, and Shadows, where I take a topic and run with it. So this is my first Spell It Out for, for 2022. And I thought I would take a topic that would be playing to my strengths and I think would be interesting for you folks. And so I'm going to begin to explore and discuss working with Aleister Crowley's and Lady Frida Harris's court cards in the Toth tarot deck. So today I'm going to just introduce some of the the, the main thoughts and then I'm going to go into sort of a deeper dive with each of the suits and the, the four cards associated with each suit in following episodes. But before we get started today, Michael has a few announcements. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our show. And it's February, so love is in the air, and we're going to have love as a theme this month, as always. So next week, we'll be doing a show on love magic and love spells. So look at some of the ethics and maybe share some of our favorite spells. Um, The following week, we will have a new guest, Dr. Megan Rose, who will talk about her book, Spirit Marriage, um, Intimate Relationships with Otherworldly Beings. And that's going to be absolutely fascinating. I know there's been stories in the news about that, people marrying ghosts. And, and whatnot. So I'm really curious to see what that's all about. And then we're going to end the month with one of our favorite paranormal friends, Holly Lindblom, will be back to visit with us. So all kinds of great stuff coming up. So get all the information on our website, sixcentsociety.com, S-A-X-T-H, all spelled out. And while you're there, if you can afford to, buy us a coffee on Ko-Fi and subscribe to our newsletter. But the most important thing you can do is click, you know, subscribe and like and ring bells and so forth on uh, YouTube. And that really helps us a lot to grow our audience and grow our show. So I don't want to take up too much time because it's a shorter episode today. So with that, I'm going to kick it back to Krista. So take it away, Krista. Great. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I'm very excited about uh, Dr. Rose coming on the show. It sounds like a really fascinating topic. And she's a mix of Uh, academic and experiential, so it's going to be really fun. Uh, So before we get started on the show, I did want to acknowledge that it is in bulk today, and for those of you that celebrate celebrate the fire festivals of the Irish uh, tradition, and one of, of course, we all know that that knows about this particular festival, it is associated with Bridget, and I was happened to be reviewing, um, I'm, I'm reading a book to review called The Secrets of the Druids by Teresa Cross. And so I I sort of looked in um, the section about this particular festival and how it's celebrated. And she had a really interesting tidbit about Bridget. So I wanted to share it with you because I hadn't heard this before. So uh, according to Teresa Cross, um, Bridget is supposed to be walking the earth during this time and bringing prosperity and good luck in almost every household. So people would make prognostications by spreading out the ashes in their hearth on the eve and waiting until morning to see if they could find the footprints of Bridget. And if they found the footprints, that there would be blessings for the year. Uh, sometimes they would find just a line. And that means that there you know, kind of some blessings, not as much. And then if it was undisturbed ashes, that was not a good sign. And it meant that Bridget had skipped them that year and they would have to make offerings for her to come back next year. So I thought that was a really interesting, uh, uh, I guess, folklore. I love it. I love the idea of her walking the earth. I hadn't really heard that before, uh, though I'm not an expert on Bridget, but I wanted to share it with you today. So anyway, let's get started on our topic. Uh, So I decided to pick particularly Aleister Crowley's court cards painted by Lady Frida Harris, of course, because A, I work with that deck. I've been working with it for many years now as my primary deck, and I simply adore it. Uh, I will say that I 
am not um, part of any of the orders, the magical orders. I have really studied Aleister Crowley on my own, and I want to encourage everyone to do that themselves, that of course there can be a benefit to going through um, anything connected to Aleister Crowley in terms of his magical orders. There certainly would be. Having said that, because I am a working tarot reader, uh, a lot of what I really learn is by doing it and by a lot, a lot, doing a lot of readings and seeing what works and what doesn't. And uh, the thing I find interesting about the uh, tarot in general is if you're really interested in the cards, assuming you have a deck you use primarily that has some, you know, merit as a tarot deck, it's not just some sort of made up deck that that's a really just a, an art deck. Uh, it will teach you what you need to know in a sense. So when I first started tarot, I didn't know anything about Aleister Crowley. I didn't even use his deck. I used the, uh, the beautiful Robin Wood deck, which I still like. But I eventually came uh, upon Aleister Crowley's deck, and I, I simply fell in love with the complexity of it. And also because it's unique in that uh, there are some other modern decks that put astrology on the minor cards, but he was the first one where I saw him do that, and I like astrology too, so I like the idea of the two together. Uh, so this is just one system that, that I really like. But I find that by, by actually getting to know the tarot in different ways, you may not use it directly in a reading, uh, but you will have a little more, you'll, you'll have more depth. So you're kind of trying to develop a relationship with the tarot by looking at it through different angles. And Aleister Crowley helps you to do that by his, the way he basically, um, the layers of his uh, correspondences with all of the cards. But uh, I wanted to particularly focus on the court cards because they can be uh, confusing. And, um, and, and you can sometimes say, well, is this a person or not? And, and one of the first things I'm going to say is in general, the court cards can represent individuals, but depending on the placement of court cards, they can represent actions, states of minds. So it's going to depend on the layout, where it falls in a layout in, in the deck, what it's going to be and if it's going to be a person. And so, but let, let's get into a little bit more. Uh, first of all, what the court cards are, in case you don't know anything about the tarot. Uh, the tarot deck is 78 cards. 16 of these cards are royal cards. They're court cards connected to the court. And there are four suits, and each have four distinct persons in the suit. And that the names can be uh, slightly different, uh, though probably some of the meaning is the same. So you'll see in Aleister Crowley, he takes the king, the name of the king, and he, he exchanges it with the word knight. Queens are the same. Uh, the prince is uh, a substitute for knight in other decks. And then we have the princess in Aleister Crowley's deck, which is a substitute for the page. And there are also some other sort of variations, I think, out there. But those are the titles we're going to be looking at uh, with Aleister Crowley. Now, the, the reason I also wanted to talk about this deck is because of the different layers and I wanted to maybe help break down some of those layers and help you to sort of figure out a way to approach this particular deck. Um, the, Aleister Crowley associates of course the tarot with the Kabbalah which we heartily agree with and so the first layer you're going to see that I think is important is is where any card falls on the tree of life. You can basically use that forever you know that, that you can take some of the things i'm going to talk about are more you know sort of deeper details that you could probably uh skip in a sense and still give an excellent reading but can give you again those subtleties those complexities that might help in particular readings but if you were just to figure out the correspondence with the tree uh which court cards go with what side of the tree what sephira in the tree what does that look like? You're going to have enough to work with really for a very long time because honestly, that is basically what I have been doing up to maybe about a year or so ago. And and then because, um, as I said, if you use the same deck, especially over and over again, it starts to sort of talk to you and sort of you get curious about like, well, why is he doing this and what does this mean? And so I, um, I've i read the, the book of Toth, which Aleister Crowley meant to go with the tarot deck, but I've also really 
um, use uh, Lon Milo Duquette's book, uh, Understanding Alistair Crowley's Ta Tarot, if you want to look at the details of the cards and the different correspondences, he, he really lays it out in a really clear system. So you can even see for yourself. I highly recommend both those books to use if you just want to dig deeper into the court cards or any of the cards, actually. So the, the first correspondence is the Kabbalah. The next thing that's equally important with, with Aleister Crowley is the idea of the elements. Now that I did learn on my own. So you have the mixing of the elements, is, which is one of the ways that this deck is quite unique because of the emphasis on the elemental mixes, which some of them don't make, they're, they're not easy combinations. But as a result, you get these dynamic energies and forces and even if they are representing people you get really much more complex looking personas and that is really true of humans in general so there's the breakdown of um the elements of course it's fire water air and earth and each of the court cards falls in a particular area of the tree of life which is one element and then each uh, court card itself, like the knight, is uh, connected to fire. So you have these layers of combinations of the two elements. So for instance, the, the knight of wands, because it falls in the second sephira, is fire of fire. And so he goes through each of these. And we're going to go through that more as I go into the details of the cards in later episodes. But immediately when you think of these combinations, you can start to think for yourself, what is fire of fire? You can even, in, in some cases, there are examples in several books I've read of natural things that represent these elements. But you yourself can think about, well, obviously fire of fire is going to be really strong and really passionate and really dynamic and also really impatient. So you already get a sense of just by looking at the elements associated with each of the court cards, what they're going to be like. And this is very accurate. And also, again, it's not something you just memorize because you can keep yourself starting to understand the implications of what is it like when I meet somebody, say the Knight of Wands is in my outside world representing people around me what is it like to interact with that energy and it you know if you don't know you can sort of test it out and so to see oh i'm meeting these kinds of people with these similar personas and and this is a really helpful thing in a reading if I, i'm trying to just interact in a business meeting or if i want to you know find a relationship just kind of knowing these elemental forces there have been people that have associated these 16 um combinations of elements with psychological types. I did try to find the article that is mentioned in Lon Milo Duquette's, but I couldn't find it anymore. And it basically, it's sort of like a Myers-Briggs breakdown of per personality. And, and though I agree with that as a fun and interesting and probably informative thing to do, I, I find as much as I love psychology, the magical element adds a different dimension like that's just one another way to look at it it's not the only way it's not going to always be right so i prefer to think of it more as energies and elemental forces myself i feel like it's more it just gives me more room to to sort of describe these forces so that's another way that that we're going to look at again sort of more in detail in, in future episodes the combination of these elements um, there's also astrological correspondences, and there's layers to that, which I don't even do at this point. So each of, um, three of the different kinds of court cards represent specific uh, zodiacal representations. And there is a system which will go over what, where you can see a consistency. And then the princesses, they don't represent a zodiacal um, correspondence. They represent space and time, like sort of a region of space above uh, the earth. Uh, but that's also very helpful. And it's also helpful um, when you get into timing. You know, you can start to sort of see through uh, repetition, if you're predicting and trying to time something, you might find that there's some synchronicity with that. Uh, and it's it's a lot of fun also to see um, what when when you were born, you can sort of see which car court card represents you. Uh, so, um, for instance, I did look, um, I did think about today we're under the Prince of Swords based on sort of the time frame in which the Prince of Swords is, is activating, which I, I really like that, that we're on that card right now. So that's another way that 
he basically has a layer to uh, the cards. And then there's also the I Ching, which honestly is it's in and of itself is a lifelong study. So, but he does associate different hexagrams with the different cards. And that's another way you can look at the cards, contemplate them, and then try to understand them in terms of being able to use them in a sort of more grounded way. So that's one of the things I, I plan on doing at some point, but I'm not going to go through it in the show. I'm only going to talk about the parts that I really have some experience with using. And also, I, I would say that if you're interested in sort of the going into the different correspondences, perhaps not to overwhelm yourself by doing all of them at once, but maybe pick um, maybe an area you like. Maybe you're interested in more of the Kabbalistic view of the cards. Maybe you like the astrology because you know, like I knew astrology before I started tarot. So that gave me some, a little bit of insight into some of the cards. Though I will say the cards sort of depict sometimes things a little differently astrologically, which I like, you know, they're, they're not quite what you would think based on the astrology. Uh, so th those are the main ways in which you can sort of look at the cards and sort of um, contemplate them. Now, I, I would say there's, there's many other things that you can do with the court cards to get to know them more. Um, and you can certainly, when one of the things I always tell people in doing readings is make sure you always look at the cards, um, at least briefly, deeply, it, no matter how familiar they are, they're going to speak to you. You're going to notice little things in the cards. Uh, by the way, uh, I would highly recommend you use the large oversized cards of Aleister Crowley because the details in there are so tiny, some of them. And if you're interested in even knowing what some of these details really are, because sometimes I can't quite see, even with the, the big cards, what it is, then I recommend Lon Duquette's book because he goes into the main symbols on the cards. And it's really neat that, you know, what, what is that particular symbol on the, the chest of one of the princes, you know? And uh, so that's one way to also look at things symbolically. But when work, working with the symbolism of the card, something Michael and I did not do initially, you can't really do a reading on the fly by, I think, most people, I'm going to say most people, by the symbolism because it's just so immense and there's so much. You, you, maybe if you only had three cards. Uh, there, there is a book I, I've read... Um, I forget his name. I think it's Yov Ben something. He has a book on the Marseille, Marseille deck, and he does that breakdown using symbolism. It's quite arduous, and I can see that if you're really good at that, that you could do it in a reading. So you, the symbolism you'd look at, you know, things like why is the, the knight on the horse? You know, why is the queen on the, the throne? What does that mean? What are the colors? He even goes into the, the things about if the card is facing a certain way. Um, again, those are things I think you can also contemplate away from the readings. And then it sort of sinks into your su subconscious mind. So what you're doing is basically finding ways to just get to know the tarot and get to know the court cards. And I, I think the court cards need that kind of um, exploration to some degree if you're going to start to get more into the complexities that they require in a reading. But as I said before, if you simply started with the correspondence with the Kabbalah, you will get so much information from that because that is where I almost always start with the court cards. I think, where does the knight go? Where does the queen go? Oh, the queen is on the left side. This is, of course, I can do this really quickly now. And then I immediately know some things about the left side of the tree and I know things about the right side. And then I also know um, I've studied more the Sephira. I've, I've gone and I don't agree with everything that even people greater than me have said about them because I am a practical tarot reader <laughs> and I have to somehow translate in it into something that can be used. But I will say that there are aspects of, of knowing what these represent, these, these states of consciousness that really make a difference. And then, of course, there are other correspondences you can get into. So it's very rich that way. Uh, so I would say, you know, you're, you're going to, if you want to use any of the court cards, you're going to want to figure out where is my starting place with them? Um, am I going to start like I do with, by knowing that they're part of the Kabbalah? Am I going to start because I know they're connected to these astrological periods? What is it I'm going to do? 
And then, uh, as I said earlier, depending on where the court card falls will determine if it can actually be a person. It certainly, if it's in the environment around you and you have the Princess of Wands, yes, it could represent people or a person in your immediate surrounding. But if it's an outcome or an action, that doesn't make sense. So then you have to look at more as a dynamic force, uh, as well as I, I think, um, well, I don't know, when it's in the, in the psychological portion or the mind or the heart of the person, it can be both. It can be, certainly if you think about the mind, it can be thinking about individual people and be a, a certain state that a person's in. So it can be kind of both, I would say. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what we're going to cover. I did also want to encourage people to read Aleister Crowley's short. I mean, I would read the whole thing on the court cards. I went back and read it about a year ago. First of all, um, I love some of his descriptions of the court cards. Some of them, especially the ones representing him. The first time I read the Prince of Wands is a card that represents his, I think it's his, uh, his rising sign. And I didn't know that. And then I thought, that sounds like Aleister Crowley. <laughs> and it was. And I just laughed. I said, oh, my God, that's just so funny. And it, he doesn't paint himself perfect, by the way. So just so you know. Um, but I wanted to share a couple of quotes from uh, just about the court cards from the Book of Toth, because I think they will help you a little bit. So uh, first of all, he says in the very beginning of uh, um, these cards constitute a pictorial analysis of the powers of the four letters of the name, which is a tetragrammaton, which I, I didn't mention, but and the four elements. They are also referred to the zodiac, but instead of assigning the three deacons of each sign to one card, the influence begins with the last deacon of one sign and continues to the second deacon of the next. That is a little confusing at first, but we're going to break that down and figure out a way that you can sort of memorize that so it's a little bit easier instead of it being just, you know, the, the same 30 deacons. It's, it splits it between like a, you would have like a mutable and a cardinal with the cardinal being emphasized. So that, that again, I think that's deliberate um, because the idea that these, these elemental forces combine in unusual ways. Uh, he also goes on to say they, rep they represent the diverse types of men and women. And he, as I mentioned earlier, a person whose sun or rising sign falls in the time period for that particular court card. So that's another way you can explore. If it's accurate, you can look at your own rising sign and see where it falls and which court card it represents. And for that, I would also recommend Lon Duquette's book because not only does he put the degrees from like, you know, this degree of this sign to that degree, but he puts the ac actual time frame, whereas Alistair Crowley doesn't put the time frame, he puts the degrees only. So it's just a little easier to just quickly go and look in the, um, understanding Alistair Crowley's Toth Tarot and sort of see, oh, I, my birthday falls here, so I am blah, blah, you know. So it, it's a lot of fun, and you can also look up famous people and see if it sort of matches some of who you think they are. Um then he, the, the other thing I, I love is towards the end of his description of the court cards, Crowley himself says that the relations between these four elements of the name are extraordinarily complex, quite beyond the limits of any ordinary treatise to discuss. They change with every application of thought to their meaning. And this is probably something that drives people crazy is with the tarot, it's a dynamic system. It's a, a system that requires you to be able to look at patterns, whether it's a small pattern of three cards, whether it's a large pattern of 19 cards. And as you do that, you know, you're hit with these combinations of cards that, that really emanate light and color. And you, you see like, almost like a kaleidoscope, you sort of say, okay, this pattern is very unique, and these are the things that stand out to me in the pattern. So the idea of, of working with the court cards in this sort of way, energetically, as well as the rest of the tarot, it just allows you the freedom to be able to see these things and not have, oh, you know, the Knight of Cups represents a tall, dark man or whatever it used to be. Um, I'm, I'm completely opposed to that in that I don't think it would hold up in, in this day and age, these descriptions of um, the different court cards as representing a specific looking person. My reasoning for that is, first of all, people change their hair color a lot. There's also, um, since, you know, I don't know, the last 
20 years, if you think about gender and how people come across looking more masculine or more feminine, and you can't tell. So I don't think the court cards represent gender. I don't think they represent individual types of people, like in terms of blonde haired, red hair, blue eyed. People sometimes have contact lenses that are colored, just isn't going to hold up in modern society. Maybe it, it was it did for a while there in the past. Uh, but I think the personas will hold up. The energies will hold up. You know, you, I've, I've met a 50-year-old man who is represented by the Princess of Wands. <laughs> so, you know, and that was his card. I remember that for some reason, specifically a, a party we read for. So uh, I think that is very accurate. But, you know, everyone can do what they want. I'm not saying I'm right. I just know from doing lots of readings that there are some things theoretically that, that just don't work with the tarot. And that's what I'm talking about primarily. Uh, so... Next time, what I'd like to do is um, start with the knights. I'm going to start with the knights and my next spell it out. And I may do all four of them. I'm going to sort of see how it goes. Um, and then I'm going to sort of go through more of the specific details associated with each of the cards. And also maybe some more application of how I've seen it operate. Uh, it is kind of curious sometimes when you see... A bunch of court cards in a reading. I, I find that has its own uniqueness and energy. And uh, in fact, that happened when I did the uh, horoscope reading for the United States. There was actually a lot of different court cards. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Actually, it was a, a horoscope reading for the whole world, which is sort of, you know, a very generalized look at things. But there was very, a lot of different court cards in the different placements. And I, I found that fascinating to try to interpret that. And of course, I would have to interpret it more energetically rather than in terms of individual people. Um, so that, that I think is a good overall start to what I'm going to be doing with the court, court cards. Uh, try not to overwhelm yourself, as I said earlier, with trying to learn everything about the court cards. I, I would say one of the fun things I've done, um, it's, it's good to be creative. So one of the things I decided to do one year, it was about, I don't know, two, three years ago maybe, I put a court card underneath my pillow at night and I wanted to see what kind of dreams I would have. And I, I think I did it, I don't know if it was for, I think it was about a week I did it. Uh, I wish now I had started and done it during the time frame that the court card represented, but I just started sort of at the beginning, which to me was the nights. And I have to admit, I, I, I very meticulously blog, uh, wrote down all of my dreams, and I had some really crazy, interesting dreams. So I haven't been able to spend the time to uh, interpret it yet, though I plan to be doing that alongside my show a little bit. I even had a dream where Aleister Crowley appeared, and that one was really fascinating, though I unfortunately couldn't remember some of the things he was showing me in the dreams. So that's a fun way to get to know them. The other thing I noticed when I was doing that is uh, whenever you focus on an archetypal energy or sort of a, a strong force, you sometimes invoke it uh, into the world. And I do remember one week where I was working with one of the queens. I, I, I have to admit, I had some interesting dynamics with women that week, though queens can certainly be men. But for, for my for whatever reason, it was women. And I had some tension and some interesting things going on. Um, and I found that there are ways you can take the court cards. And if you're lacking in something, you can take the opposite and use them to bring that quality and in energy into your life. Now, I, I think that might work with any court cards, but I do think that the reason that Aleister Crowley and Lady Frida Harris have such a great deck is the amount of knowledge, time, energy, brilliance that went into the design of those decks, the intention, I don't think every deck can can really do what th this particular deck does. So anyway, I think we're getting close to the end of our show. Uh, I hope that you will take out the Aleister Crowley deck and look at the court cards this month before I go into the next one. And have a great week. Thanks for tuning in. And we look forward to Seeing you next time as we continue to explore the esoteric and the obscure together.